Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel and welcome to Your Questions Answered. Now I did a post on YouTube asking you guys, the beginners, things that you're gonna get stuck with because I've been there as a beginner at the, at the start of my career and don't get embarrassed, just put your comments up, put some questions up and I'll answer your questions today. As you can see, we've got a few bits on the table. I'm gonna get through these questions. Now I also did the post on Facebook on a uh, forum so I've grabbed some of the questions from there and I've grabbed some of the questions from the YouTube post, compiled them together for a video for you guys. So apologies if all of them aren't on here, but there will be more of these sort of questions answered. I'm gonna do some more of these on the channel. So we're gonna look at the first question, which is this one. What techniques do you recommend for practicing detail work? Right, what techniques for detail work? now? I always said to people when you when you want to get sort of really honed in on your detail work, you've really got to get your trigger control down. You really have with an airbrush. It's the key thing to get down is the trigger control. Now, things that I would practice for my detail work is dot work, dots, going in on small dots and doing dagger strokes, but start to bring your dagger strokes really, really small down so you're getting your dagger strokes down to like say about four mil long three mil long and this will really home in on your trigger move, moving your trigger and just feathering your trigger really smaller a thing that you can do i know this sounds probably a little bit childish to do but using dot to dot pictures like this is absolutely brilliant for practicing your detail work because on the dot to dot pictures you're making the image up and you can move around going from like the numbers, like one, two, this one's one to 106. You can go round in lines, which you can do in dagger strokes, and you can create small dagger strokes, and that keeps your trigger movement going on a dot to dot. So they're pretty cool for practicing. So that's what I do for practicing your detail work. Dagger strokes nice and small, and different ways doing dagger strokes, and going in on your dots. Homing in on your dots will get you your accuracy when you're going up to something. If you want to do a little pinpoint on something, you can go straight in and you can hit it straight away. Working on crosshairs as well. That's why I always say do grids, do box grids and put dots in the centers of the boxes and then go to the crosshairs, pinpoint, go up, bang, hit it on the crosshairs with your dots. So I hope that's answered your question. We will move on to question number Two. How important are MAC valves on airbrushes? Right, how important are MAC valves on airbrushes? They're not that important, they're really not, because you can dial your air pressure in on your compressor. Now, the beauty of a MAC valve is you've got it on the front of your brush or you've got it on the body of your brush that comes down or on your quick connect. The beauty of them is if you're working on close-up stuff, you're on detail, or you're working just in general on a piece of artwork, you can dial your pressure in on your brush instead of fumbling under your table, at your compressor, pressing your trigger and then setting your air on your compressor or setting your air on your main line like I've got here in the studio. So Mac valves are good. The brushes that have got Mac valves on are the Creos. I do own the Creos PS270, that's got a Mac valve, and they work really well to the front here. The other style of Mac valve you get, h and have got one on the old Evolution Silverline Solo, which is on the body here. These also work really well. And I've also got one on the actual airline just here. So when you clip it into your brush, you can dial it here. These ones on the brushes on the airlines can be a little bit fiddly because when you've got your hand on your brush, you can sometimes catch these. And if you buy the cheap ones, they undo and then all of a sudden the pin flies out and goes across your studio and you've got loads of air spurting out. So if you're gonna go for one of these on an airline, buy a decent one or if you have got the money and you can afford one on a brush, go for one on a brush because they are handy to have. So I hope, that, I hope that's answered your question on the MAC valves and are they important? They, they, they are, if you want to dial your air in, 
but they're not that important if you've got your compressor near to you and you can just dial in your compressor. So right, we'll move on to the next question. What is the best detail airbrush? Oh, question number three. What is the best detail airbrush? Now, I could mention so many different airbrushes. Um, we've all got our personal favorites. My personal favorite is my own Infinity. Would say is the best. I've got other very good detail brushes, but my go-to if I'm doing detail is H&S for me. It, um, it's the H&S My Infinity, My Custom Infinity. I do own a custom Micron, so saying what is the best, I'll give you an example of ones that I think that are very good. The Infinitec by H&S, the new Evolution by H&S is incredible. The Graudes is another good one. Custom Micron, any of the custom Microns will be brilliant on detail. When it comes to Creos, PS270 can get seriously down and the PS771 is a really good one as well. There's a lot, the Mobius 0.3 is a crack off of detail. So there's some of the, like, the ones that are out there, but when you say which one is the best, there's a lot of people that would say custom micron, hands down custom micron. At the end of the day, it depends what you're doing with it. If you're doing photorealistic work, you're, you're with photorealistic work, you're sort of puffing the paint. So it's a different style of painting than someone that's painting like, that's got a lot more line work in it and things like that, where you're using the brush a lot more for doing longer strokes and things where you're getting a lot of detail. It's a hard one on the application really. Um, the ones that I've said I think are very good, but we've got something special coming from H&S, which is gonna be the new Infinite, and I think that is gonna, um, it's gonna pip the post on all of them guys, it really is. Because after using the Ultra, the Evolution, it's a phenomenal brush, the Evolution is just using that. And we're gonna see a little bit more of that later on. Um, but yeah, they're the ones that I recommend on sort of the best of the bunch for going in for detail and then ones there. Right, we'll move on to the next question. I have a problem with very fine lines. I'm using the PS270 and Createx illustration. After half an hour of airbrushing, I have to pull the trigger more and more to get the paint to spray. Right, this one is, it's about the PS270 and is using Createx Illustration and after half an hour of sort of spraying with it, the brush is struggling and it's, it's having to pull back more and more on the trigger. Now I know exactly what this is. I use Createx Illustration in the studio. <clears throat> now, temperatures for one, I'd say in your studio, whatever temperatures that you're running up, it's really warm and you've got your lid off, you've got your cap off, your 270, your paint will start to dry up and start to thicken up in the cup. So first off, I'd recommend put your cap on. You've got a one-to-one -one mix and that's what I'd mix mine out as being one-to-one. -one. So no dramas with your paint mix whatsoever. But you're saying after half an hour of spraying, going sort of down on sort of fine lines and things like that, I reckon it's tip dry. If you're doing a half hour hit, and then it's starting to clog, I think you're not checking your needle and nozzle enough on the front end. It's, I guarantee it that'll be tip dry on the front end of the brush because point twos will choke up quite quick, especially if you're painting with them for quite a bit of time. So just double check your tip dry. I always, when you see me paint, when I'm painting for long periods of time, like I did in one of the videos of the day, I was painting, and I always, always check, I'll pinch, do that, or I'll put it in the dread effects tip tool and give it a quick spin in that. But I always flick the trigger like this and give it a little flick, move to the side, flick to the flick, look, and then go back in and put a piece of paper to the side of you so you're not 
committing straight the way once you've gone like this and you go straight back in. Clear your brush and then go straight in on your piece of paper to the side and then check your spray pattern before you commit to your piece of artwork. But I guarantee it, it'll be, it's tip dry on the front, on the needle, because you said that it's, you're having to sort of like strip the brush down to clean it through. It'll be the build up on here. It's where you're working long periods of time, you're getting proper zoned into your artwork, which you do, I've done it, and you carry on, carry on. Then it starts to build up and you'll start to feel it. You'll, you'll hear it for one, you'll hear the air pressure change, the flow of the brush, it will change. And then you'll either get a spit and it'll land on your work, a little spit out. So just keep, keep referring to the front, pinch, press down on your air, quick flick back, couple of blasts down on the air and it cleans the front and then check on your piece of paper. So I hope that's helped you out on that one. We'll move on to the next question. Can the new Harder and Steambeck trigger be installed to the old Evolution brushes or Infinity Airbrush? Right, I've seen a few comments on this, people asking, do the new triggers out the new H&S's, out the new Evolution, do the new triggers fit the old brushes? We're gonna find out right now, guys. I've not tried this, so I've got an original Evolution Silverline Solo, and I've got the new Evolution CR Plus 2024, and we'll try it. So back off the Solo, needle out, pull back, take the trigger out, and I'm leaving this back mechanism in. We'll do the same with the 2024 needle out, pull back, take the trigger out, and we will try the new trigger. In the old brush. And it doesn't seem like it's going to do it. No. I can't get it to drop. Oh, it has. It has. It's gone in. So the answer is, it does go in, but I've not tried it for painting. So, you've just seen that there, live on camera. That's the new trigger in the old body. Now, it seems to go back and pull back as far as the original one did. What I'll do is I'll do a separate video on this for you and we'll see what it sprays like and we'll just give it a test of spray. But it did drop in, it has gone in. So the answer is, so far, yes. I don't know how it's gonna work releasing the tension on the yeah, it's, we'll give it a spray test, but the answer is yes, it does work. So there will be another video coming up on that. So we'll move on to the next question. Airbrush stencils, do they help on the early stages of airbrushing? Right, the next question. I know who this, this like, question's from. It's about airbrush stencils and do they sort of help you out on the early stages of airbrushing? Now, when you're a beginner, you want to paint everything. You want to grab hold of everything and just give it a go because you're just you're passionate about what you want to do and you want to spray some paint and the first thing you tend to pick up is a stencil which whenever you spray a stencil it's sort of one dimension you sort of spray it you usually put black in your airbrush you've usually got a, a skull or something like that and you spray it and it's putting all your dark shadow areas in and when you move it away you've got like your dark outlines and you've got a skull and that's sort of as far as you go with it because you don't know how to shade and how to make that skull look from flat to look more three-dimensional. Now, I think stencils are good for beginners um, just to get to grips with and just for practicing putting some paint down. 
spraying some paint and going over something and just seeing how you can sort of get your spray distance and things like that and just check your distance, how much paint you're putting down. You can buy multi-layer stencils. They are a little bit more expensive, but I think the multi-layer stencil brings the 3D-ness out of it because you put your first layer down, drop your shading down, and then you put your next one down, you'll drop your mid-tone in, and then you put your next one down, and you drop your highlight in. And then when you move them all away, you've got that 3D look. Now, the other way you can do it is is if you've got a stencil of a skull and you've got a reference of that skull that's been painted so you can look at it because there's nothing worse than spraying on a stencil and you don't know where to go about shading it you don't know what bit to shade from because you're looking at black outlines but if you've got a reference next to you of that skull that's been painted or a photograph of that skull that's been painted, you've got something to look at and guide you from. And that's, that's why I don't sort of really use stencils. I used to use them in the past, and I look back at my old artwork that I've used with stencils, and I was doing exactly that. I didn't know how to shade them in. And you could see that they just looked flat. When I sprayed on them, they just looked flat. I think stencils serve a purpose on certain things stencils like when you do sort of like the low rider patterns where you're spraying through um, things like the neck curtains the, to get the floral designs that's basically a material stencil you stretch it over a bonnet or a wing or whatever you're doing and you're spraying through to get that pattern them sort of flat patterns like that look good on that style of artwork but my advice is if you get a stencil Get either a multi-layer one to have a go with because they're really cool because then you can just build your layers up or look for a reference photo that can go alongside your stencil and then you've got something to work from so i hope that helps you out we will move on to the next question i have the ps289 and the ps2 says was wondering if i put a 0.18 needle and nozzle on one of those would it be a bad idea Right, this one, he's got the PS289 and he's got the PS270 and he's wanting to change it up to put the 0.18mm needle and nozzle set up in it. Is it a good idea? Me personally, I wouldn't. Um, it's basically, your, I can see where you're coming from. Your, the price of the PS771 is around 200 and probably 260 around there to get that 0 0.18 and then you can look at the separate parts and you've got to buy the whole front head assembly so you'll be buying that you'll be buying the whole front head assembly of the brush needle nozzle air cap crown cap the whole lot to then adapt over to your 270 or your 289 me personally yes the 771s are nice on the 018 but you can go a cheaper option than that and you can get just as good detail if you're after a, a 018. I would go, first option for me, I would go Evo, Ardor and Steenbeck Evo on a 0 0.28 because that will hands down easily match the 771 on trigger response and detail and it's cheaper. You could go a cheaper option again and you could go for the Mobius 0 0.3 and that is cheap, a lot cheaper, um, but that will still get you as good a detail down as 018. So keep your 289 and your 270 as they are, because I think the 289 is on a 03, and I think that's a great all-rounder, and it should get brilliant down on detail. The PS270 as well, I think, is a phenomenal detail brush. I've done some really cool work with the 270. I absolutely love it. It's a great brush on detail. So thinking that you're going to gain a lot by going to the 1.8. I really don't think you are with the two brushes you've got. You've got a good all-rounder with a 0.3 on the 2.89 and the 2.70. I just think it's really good. If you get your paints dialed in on the 2.70 and your air pressure, it can get some cracking detail down. So I hope that's answered your question. We will move on to the next one. I am having trouble with straight lines when I airbrush freehand. Right, having trouble with straight lines when airbrushing freehand. 
nice easy fix for you, nice and simple. If you're following an outline, if you've got your piece of artwork and it's outlined and you've got lines on it and you're struggling to follow them lines, I sometimes when I paint, I won't do a full consistent line. I'll, I'll go halfway, break it up, and then continue again, go back onto that line and continue again. First thing you need to do is bring your other hand up to your brush. Both hands on the brush, it's a lot steadier. That will steady you straight away. Now, whether you're a left air or a right air, you tend to, you will do a line smoother in one direction or the other. Find the most comfortable direction that you can spray at and if it means turning your piece of artwork round to go in that direction, do that, that will help. Another thing that will help is as well, bring your hand up to your brush and put your pink air or a part of your other hand on your work as a guide on your piece of paper and slide along with your brush like that and that will act as a nice steady guide so you can get nice consistent straight lines you'll sometimes see me where my hand comes up to the paper and i've just got one finger out like that as a guide and i will move with it and it just steadies you up instantly steadies you up another thing you can do as well when people tend to follow lines they stare at the front of the brush you stare at your needle at what it's doing. Don't stare here, put your eyes here. So look at the line about three or four inches away and just look at the line away from your brush. And when you do that, your hands will follow where your eyes are going and it just instantly, you'll get your straight lines. So that's a nice sort of simple fix. Turn your artwork round if you're better at one way. So if you're better going that way, you can always turn your artwork around to adapt for your movement, or if you go that way, vice versa, left or right handed is usually the case. Steady your hand, bring your hand up to your brush, put a finger out onto your panel and move with it and slide on your piece of artwork, it does help. And look at the line in front of your brush, not at your needle. So I hope that one's answered your question. We'll move on to the next one. I am struggling to thin hobby craft paint for my airbrush. Thinning paint through your airbrush. Now, I read the whole, I didn't put all the comments on this or the question. Used to one style of paint and you get used to one style of paint and you know it, you know the brand. And then you sort of grab a Hobbycraft one, like what I've got here. You try it and you struggle. And you will do because you get so used to one brand. I've got like brands that I use and I've got the cheaper brands. Now I only pick up the cheaper brands when I'm desperate for a colour and I've only got, say, I need a brown, oh, I've got the Hobbycraft brown. Now the way I'll go about it if I've got a cheaper paint is they're usually thicker bodied acrylics. So get your thicker bodied acrylic, get your little plastic cup, get a wooden coffee stirrer. I usually go for a little plastic cup and a coffee stirrer, drop a couple of blobs of the Hobbycraft thick acrylic in. Then I would go for some of the Flow Improver, which is this one here. This is an acrylic Flow Improver. I'd go a couple of drops of that and then some distilled water and then mix it up. Mix it nice. Get your normal airbrush paint that you usually mix that you know your consistency of. So if you're using, say, Createx, say you're using Createx Illustration, that's your go-to, and now you're trying other paints, or you're using Golden, they spray straight out the bottle, or mix it to your one-to-one -one that you're used to mixing it to. Get a plastic, empty, see-through pot, or a cup, little half-pint cup, and then just do two drops or three drops on the edge and watch it run down. You can time it, you can time that. You could set a timer and time it and see how quick it runs to the bottom. And then get your mix of your hobby craft. I know this sounds a bit technical. Get your mix of your hobby craft, 
do your two drops of flow improver, say two drops of distilled water, get the consistency out. And all you've got to do is mirror match that consistency to the flow rate of the one that you're used to and you will be good to go. You'll have no more dramas mixing your paint. It's, it's just finding that sweet spot with the thicker bodied, but they do work. I will jump onto other paints when I'm running out of my nice airbrush paints and I'm on a project and I need a colour, I know I've got these thick backup ones that I can thin down and I can use. So it can be, it can be done, but that is well worth getting. That one there, the uh, Winds and Newton Artist Acrylic Flow Improver, that one seems to work really well with the cheaper, thicker bodied airbrushed acrylics. So I hope that's answered your question. We'll move on to the next one. What are the best ways of transferring your picture onto a surface? Right, what are the best ways of transferring your image onto a surface? Now, there's loads of ways. The way I go about it nowadays is I always go projector, um, unless I'm doing something small, but I'll talk you through some of the different ways you can do it and sort of cheaper ways you can do it. If you wanted to transfer this, that image, we've just done this one on the channel. Now, if you wanted to transfer that, you're working from a printout, A4 printout, and you're, you wanna put this down to a white surface. So if you've got like a white piece of Bristol board or paper or white canvas, and you wanted to get this image across to your canvas, the cheapest and easiest way to do it is get a soft HB pencil, this is old school, this is school days. Scribble over the back and fill the back of your piece of paper with the pencil lead over the top, just loads and loads of it. So that would be all covered in pencil. Then put that down to your white piece of paper, masking tape the four corners, and then just trace over the top with a harder pencil tip over the top, then when you move it away, you've got your outline to work from. You can do it that way. The way that I do it is project. So I'm doing basically the same sort of thing, but I'm projecting the image up to the piece that I'm working on. And then I sort of move to one side, so the, the image is coming across here, and work in the shadow side and just pencil round and pencil the image in. That's how I achieve that one on the vinyl video that I've just done. There are other ways you can do it as well. You can get a, you can get some stuff called trace down. <clears throat> and it's basically like carbon paper. So you would have your printout like this, your white piece of paper underneath. You can put your trace down down. You put your piece of artwork on top of it and you'll do the same again. You'll be, you'll be penciling over the top of your print and then the trace down will transfer graphite across to your piece of paper. The bonus with trace down is you can get it in the gray. So if you're going on top of white, it'll put you a pencil outline down and you can get it in a white sheet as well. So if you're working on a black surface, you can get the white trace down that goes behind your print. And then when you pencil round, it will leave you a white outline on a black surface. So they're the sort of ways you can go. You can draw straight down with a pencil. If you're really good at drawing, you can go down on a white panel and draw it, and then you can go in and then you can start to paint. But my preferred way is projector. It's just, it's quick, it's nice and easy. Unless I'm doing something that's round or like a crash helmet or something like that, different ball game, I'll probably go trace down if I'm doing something like a crash helmet or something that's got a big curve because when you project, when there's a curve and that projector image hits it, it just bends around and it distorts and it looks all over the place. But projector for me first and then trace down is sort of second option. So I hope that's answered your question. We'll move on to the next one. How can I buy women's tights for straining paint without looking dodgy? I've got to answer it. This is Steve Wheeler. This was on Facebook. How can I buy women's tights for straining paint without looking dodgy? My advice, Steve, 
just go to Primark because you need to be dodgy just to go into that shop. So that's questions answered. That's Steve Wheeler that dropped that. If you want to check out his channel, I'll leave a link in the description. Brilliant artist and a brilliant tattooist as well. So check out Steve's channel. Big thumbs up to you, Steve. I did giggle at that when I seen it. We're going to move on to the next one now. I seen in one of your videos, you showed us the inside of the Galeri Mobius with a small camera. How does the new evolution by Harder and Steenbeck compare to the Mobius? Oh, camera in the Mobius. Right, we shall give it a go, guys. I'm going to pop you some pictures up now. So we did the inside of the Mobius and I showed you the defects on the Mobius on the inside. Now this person's asking what are the internals like on the H&S Evolution? So this is behind the trigger guys now just look at how nice <laughs> the finish is on this brush on the internals now this is why i say harder and steenbeck have come on leaps and bounds their original brushes were amazing to start and then when you look at the quality on the new brushes i think it's really hard for people to see quality and understand quality until you see a process on a brush that's being made. Now I'm going to be going over to Harder and Steenbeck this year and I'm going to take you around the factory and film how these brushes are made because then that will give you a full-on insight to what goes into their brushes. Now as you can see in that picture there that's behind the trigger and I'm pressing the trigger down and you can see the tolerances are so precise on the insides of that brush. The next shot is where I've took the trigger out and I'm moving the camera up inside the body and the bodies are just really machined and they're very clean. All the bits on the brush are just seamless. And that's why I say, and I always bang on about the H&S brushes because this is where you're getting your quality. You get your triple plate chrome to the exterior, but then when you it's only until you stick a camera inside it like I've just done there and then you get to appreciate actually what goes into them. The machining and things like that, they're just top notch guys, they really are. And that's why I'm really digging H&S. I just absolutely love the brushes. The way they strip down is just the easiest of brushes to do. You put them back together nice and easy. I've said it before, they're like Lego. If you played with Lego when you was a kid, it's just simple, you just put the blocks together and you can make the thing out of the box. And that's how H&S brushes are. We've just had a look at the trigger. I will do another video because I moved the trigger from the Evo to the old Evo. I will do another video, see how it sprays, see what it's like. But it went across. And this is what I mean by the sort of Lego. All the needle and nozzles, air caps, all interchange. So, if you really, really dig in your old H&S Evo that you've had for 14 years like I've got here, I wanted to upgrade it, which I did. I upgraded this to a 0.15 Infinity front end with the prong cap. And that's what I did because this one had the older style crown cap to the front that was like a solid piece. So I changed it up. And it just it's just really cool that you can you can buy a brush and you can just upgrade it to what you want. If you love the Ultra, that's your first brush and you're loving the Ultra, the feel of it and everything, you just get on so well with it, you can tweak it, you can add a little bit extra to it. Same with the Geraldes, you can do the same with that. With the Infinite, I have with that, with my one, they're just brilliant brushes. So I hope that's answered your question on that. That was the last one. So I hope you enjoyed the video today, guys, on answering a few of your questions. I want to do some more of these, so keep dropping your comments on that post and on the Facebook post, and I'll just go back to the post, look through the ones that I've not done today, pull a load more out, and we'll just sit down, have a chat, and go through some more stuff, just so it gives you a little bit of insight. If you're stuck on anything, I don't think there's nothing worse than trying to find somewhere to go to get the answers. You'll get the answers right here. Just drop them comments down and I'll do you a video and we'll talk through. And I'll do some little demos like I did today, a few little demos on explaining 
the easiest way of going about it because I know exactly how you feel as a beginner. I was there 14, well, probably getting on 20 years ago. YouTube was just or was running then. And there was like, no one was giving anything away. It was like sort of KJ. The pro artists were just showing you their little clips of what they could do. And you weren't really getting the information and you struggle. And there's nothing worse than struggling. It's a long road if you struggle, but I'll guide you as much as I can. So thanks for watching. Don't forget if you are new to the channel, click that subscribe, press that notification, drop your comments and drop your comments on the post and we'll do another one of these videos because I really enjoy it with you guys. So thanks again. Cheers.